Hello everyone. Oh, that's interesting. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm Cedric. Uh, I work at a company called AppDirect. We're LUI. Uh, it's a company of around uh, 250 engineers uh, distributed in four different offices. Uh, we've been doing uh, micro front ends for more than a year now in production. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, we have uh, 30 micro front ends currently running into one products. And uh, yeah, we use module federation, so we're going to talk about our usage of module federation to manage all this. So here's the game plan. So first, I'm going to just do a little bit of introduction about micro front ends and why we needed it. Um, I know there's like multiple talks about micro front ends, so I'm going to try to go fast around that, and then we're going to see uh, what is uh, webpack module federation, how it works. I'll show you an example in production. So actually, the code of AppDirect and seeing how it runs. And then we're going to talk about uh, some advanced considerations, things like deployment, design consistency, and server-side rendering. And finally, uh, I'm going to tell you what I think about it and should you use it. And uh, it's going to be my opinion. So if you, you know, look at the uh, comments on Hacker News, you'll see there's a broad, uh, broad uh, people think different things. So this going to be my opinion using it. But obviously, uh, you can do your own research afterwards. So. Okay, micro front ends. Uh, just a bit of introduction in a nutshell, I works, right? So uh, the idea of micro front ends comes uh, in, in one way. So you have, it's the idea of like, we have one large application, uh, we want to split that in multiple independent uh, applications. Uh, in your usual, usual uh, setup, you're gonna have your container applications, which is gonna be uh, maintaining the state of the page, knows about all the other micro front ends, basically act as a glue for everything. Uh, and then you're going to have your independent micro front ends. So these micro front ends, usually they have their own repo, their own CI CD deployment pipeline. Uh, and basically, it's a, it's a way to manage apps, but in the same kind of container. Uh, and uh, micro front ends started to be popular around 2000, 2018. Uh, and in my opinion, it's basically a way to answer how we scale teams and organizations. And I'm going to generalize a lot here, but like if you look at like startups, how they evolve, especially like five, six years ago. Like you'll see, like you have a small team, you have a monolith, then you grow a little bit, then you start wanting to splitting your front end, your back end, thinking about more about APIs. And if you go even more, then you think about domains, right? So you have domain team. I want to talk, think about specifically on the domain and build services. And at that point, usually what happens is your monolith becomes slow. It becomes an endurance to your productivity, and you want to kind of like move to something that enables you to go faster and be a bit more cleaner. And usually that's where the services architecture kind of comes into play. The problem though for front end is at that point, like probably your front end application is like a big soup of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS all intertwined. So how do you move away from that? And that's in my opinion what micro front end address the best, right? It's a way for us to have teams to be completely independent, be in charge of their own journey from the front to the back. So being able to deploy their own services, but also being able to deploy their own front end and be completely in charge of it. So, um, like why we do that, there's multiple advantages why you want to move, you want to move to a micro front end architecture when you have like this big monolith. One is uh, because they're completely dependent, you have your own repo, they kind of become technology agnostic. It depends on your architecture and how you kind of like set it up. But what it means, basically, if your monolith is using React 16 with like the old version of Redux, you know micro, micro front ends, you can basically, it's like, you know, like new things, right? So you can do whatever you want. So you can use React 18, React Query, maybe you don't need Redux at all. So your, your teams can uh, decide to use much modern like, tech around it. Uh, and because they do that, like, uh, you usually have less tech depth. They're in charge of everything in the repo, so they understand the state of the complete application. And, uh, because it's smaller, again, the monolith probably at that point, like if you think 10 years down the line, uh, building an application, uh, what happens, for example, for us is that we don't deploy a monolith every time someone merges to master, right? It goes to 
a state where it goes integration, then a week later it's going to staging, goes, and a week later it goes production. With a setup like this, uh, what happened is like because the teams are in charge uh, of the, the repo and their CICD pipeline, they can decide to merge something to master, they apply automatically to integration, do a smoke test, and then do the other step to go to staging and then to production automatically. So it enables teams to go much faster in the cycle of building their applications. So yeah, so that's my introduction on micro front end. So now we're gonna move to uh, model federations. So uh, how do you do micro front end, right? There's multiple ways, uh, and usually was before that it exists, like there were things like, oh, we're just gonna render the application directly in another container. But uh, two years ago, Webpack introduced something called Modded Federation. And basically, Modded Federation makes kind of like this idea of micro front end first class support inside Webpack. So how does that work? Think about your typical reapplication. And think of these as blocks, right? So you have components, potentially a store, libraries. Think of all of those as independent, independent blocks. What if uh, you could take one of those blocks from one application, pass it to the other application, but at runtime? So when I say at runtime, I mean literally when the browser is loading application two, he's able to uh, call application one, pull this file into its own life cycle and use it like any other kind of modules you would have in your node modules or your source folder. And that's basically what module federation allows. And you can see like kind of like a, a very simple implementation here. So uh, in MFE1, uh, and it's all done to webpack.config. So you go to webpack.config.js, you go to the plugin section, and then uh, you instantiate the new modification plugin. You give it the name, it's called MFU1, it could be name anything. And then you'll see the, pro, uh, the exposes object. So in there, basically you decide, okay, in MFU1, what I want to expose to other applications. So in this case, we want to expose a button. In MFU2, which is the one that's pulling from other applications, you do the same thing, you go in the uh, web packet config, you go in the plugin section, you instantiate the middle federation plugin, and then instead of exposes, you'll see you have the remotes object. And basically in remotes, you're gonna tell every other application that MFE2 has access so that it can, uh, that it can pull uh, other modules from. And when you do that properly, uh, you're able to do something like import button from MFE1 in your code, like it was anything else that was in your null module, static on your, you know, in your build or in your computer, like you know, you have your module and source folder. Uh, but instead, what uh, what model federation does when you do that, it actually does an HTTP request. So in the background, there's a lot of magic here. But like in the background, what it does, like you do the import, it's going to do HTTP request to whatever wherever MFU one is, pull that in, and then make it, it make this completely transparent to you. So for you, it's kind of like simple. It's just like in your normal workflow. When in background, what really happens is there's an HTTP request to a script, the script is loaded, and after that, uh, it will basically tell, okay, like this component is at this location, pull it from there, and, and uh, like give it access to it. Um, yeah, two things to, to see here. One, you can see that I'm not importing a micro front end in this example, I'm importing a button. So, but the federation goes way further than just uh, doing it being something for micro front end. You can literally import anything you want from an application to another. So anything like functions, utils, uh, a component. So in, the, in this example, MF1 could be a component library that I want to expose to other applications, and other applications can pull for it directly from the browser. Um, what would be the advantages of this? Well, for example, you have a component library. You want you have like 30 applications. You want an update to this to to your components in terms of starting. Uh, being automatic in production without having to update the 30 other uh, applications, right? Well, with model federation, you could do that. Uh, I'm not saying you should, but you could. Uh, you could expose a store, like your Redux store could be exposed as uh, as something that other application can use. So it's basically, there, there's not a lot of limits there. Like you can literally expose anything that is part of your application to other applications. So it's quite interesting. Uh, I, I directly use it only into a micro end context but you could uh, do much more. The other thing I wanted to say, uh, you can see in MFU1, in the remotes here, we have MFU1 app localhost 8083. 
Uh, obviously, that works when you're in dev. That doesn't work when you have like a CI CD pipeline and like you can pull from local. So you have a couple of options to manage where are your remotes. You can put a string. Uh, you can use environment variable potentially to change that strings if you know exactly where is going to be the CDN for this. Uh, the other option you have is this actually also support a function. Uh, it's called a promise and a promise. And basically, the idea is you could do a neat Ajax call. When you need to pull your remote, so you do an Ajax call in your browser. Uh, and basically, MFIDU is going to request to some API or some JSON object somewhere and tells it, oh, tell me where MFU1 is right now and be able to load it uh, using that. Um, yeah. The other option that you have, there's a third option, uh, is doing it through code. So uh, for pulling remotes, like I said, you can do it with a string, environment variable. You can use this uh, promise, promise in the Webpack config, but you can also forego everything of that and just do it directly in your code. And I know like it's very, very verbose. <laughs> Uh, this is taken. Uh, uh, this is taken from the uh, sorry, Model Federation uh, documentation, like directly. So I didn't write this, and the idea is just to show you that the like there's another way to do it, and we do it this way at Direct because, uh, and I think I said it, but like we're distributed in four different offices. Uh, I don't control people building micro front ends. I just handle the framework. So I don't know how many micro front ends going to be. So I don't want to have a static list. So we're actually pulling that from a JSON object. And then uh, we're pulling all the micro front ends. And depending on the path, we're going to say, OK, from this path, there is this application. Go load it. So doing it through code uh, made much sense for us. Um, and yeah, so again, like there are examples to do this directly in Model Federation. And it's very robust. One thing I want to take to your attention is the web act, Webpack in its sharing. Uh, you might wonder, like, what, how does that work with application dependencies? Because, for example, that button we imported, it needs React. It might need some other things, like we don't know. So uh, Model Federation handles pulling your dependencies, dependencies for you. But you can also uh, decide which one you can share across all the, the, your uh, federated modules. So I mean, if we go back here, you could have another property here called shared. And you can, like, some, some of the examples I see and people do, you could literally take we could do your package at JSON dot dependencies, right? Pull that as a JSON object and do dot dependencies and pass up your new shared property. What is that going to do? Like every time you load a um, uh, uh, federated modules, you're going to look at the dependencies already loaded, use semantic versioning, and be able to decide if it needs to pull the other chunks. So automatically, uh, what do you need? What what's the advantages? Well, you don't have to like for example. Like you use React in all your application, right? You can uh, share React so that like you don't have to repo React every time uh, you load a new micro front end. Which was what kind of like one of the big issue like before Model Federation is like in terms of packaging your application. They're very large application because every time you're having a micro front end, you're repo, you're re-adding all the dependencies for everything. But Model Federation, like the cool thing is like you can share those dependencies. It handles semantic versioning for you so that you don't have to care to it. Although there's a couple of gotchas, and we'll see a bit later for now. Okay, so uh, we're going to move to the AppDirect example. So this is the AppDirect UI. Uh, just to give you a bit of context with the like the yellow and red, <laughs> red and blue lines, they're not part of the UI. They just like to show you a bit of like how this is structured. Uh, AppDirect Mollet is 15 years old, so we're kind of a very old startup. We have hundreds of pages in there. So um, we had to find a way to move out of the Mollet, right? So the guys that built this like 15 years ago, they used uh, something, they, it's in Java, and they use a front end a framework in Java called Wicket. So uh, this is recorded, so I won't say what like front engineers think of Wicket at AppDirect, but it's not good things. So, uh, like over the years, they, they went to uh, a lot of cycle, like it's 15 years. So, they went to Backbone, and after that, they tried to embed React application in the Mollet. But the problem is still the Mollet takes 15 minutes just to run, like load it locally on your computer, right? And it's in Java. So, for front end engineers, it's very difficult to work with. So, that just like wasn't working uh, like for future future use for us. So, we had to find a way to move away from the Mollet completely, not just trying to embed. React application into it. So what we did is a very a typical uh, micro front end setup. So we have a container application. The container application, I know it's a bit small, but like the handles, the header footer, the routing, navigational components, 
error page, global application model. So everything that comes kind of global to us uh, is handled by the container application. So React application, and it's the same concept that I showed you, like, like MFE2, MFE1. Like we have, uh, this is, and we're using model federation. What we do is every other teams at AppDirect, they build micro front ends. We provide a React boilerplate, so that's easy for them to set up. That includes like things like, uh, you know, ESLint and like the, every, everything that they need to get really, really faster in integration with our CICD pipeline, smoke tests and all that. And uh, we have a CLI that just say, oh, I want to be this app be named this. It's going to be used at this path. And then basically after that, they need to register with the container application. But beside that, they're completely independent. So it's a very small part of the application. If I go back to poor UI here, so the container application is everything but the blue section. And the blue section is our micro front ends. Um, you, you can configure this at AppDirect. So for example, you want to have a full page without any of this. You can just, uh, you, you can say, I, I don't want any of this, and then you have a blank canvas. But most of the time, you will want those elements. And the reason we use this setup is that we follow quite fast. At the beginning, we, oh. I'll take it. It's uh, the guy that forgot his phone. Okay, so uh, I was saying that, yeah, uh, we have a typical uh, micro front end uh, set up here. Um, okay, let's move on. No, let's go to the demo. Okay, so this is uh, AppDirect. Um, what you see here, you have the header, the screen nav is actually part of the container. Everything here is actually a micro front end. So from Good Afternoon, Cedric. So when we refresh the page, I think you can kind of see the, the setup from just refreshing that the micro front end loads afterwards, right? So I'm gonna open the inspector just to see, tell it like, so you can see a bit like our Webpack uh, Mother Federation is handling all this. So go to network, JavaScript, let's refresh. So we have index.bundle here. And you see it's called micro container. We, have, we call it this way, but it's the container app, right? So this bundle is loaded on every page that is a uh, part uh, of, you know, the, of the micro front end setup. And then after that, depending on the path, uh, this will go and load the remote entry.js for the micro front end. So this is like slash admin slash remote entry. So this is a micro front end uh, package with model federation. And basically from there, uh, but the federation will do its own thing on pulling out your bundles. So this is bundles taken from uh, that it knows it needs to load to load this micro front end. And the more you share dependencies, the more it's going to split that into chunks, right? So in identify these chunks with what are the dependencies in there so that it doesn't have to reload those things if it's already loaded. And just to give you an example, like if I go here, key manager, like this is part of the uh, monolith. If I go back, this is part of the container plus micro front end. So one is in React completely, one is in Java plus like some React stuff. So it was important for us that like the kind of the look stay exactly the same as you move between each other's. So how does that work? Let's go in the code a little bit. So hopefully, ah, yeah, it's big enough, I think. Uh, everyone can see it? I think so, right? Like, but, yeah, okay. Uh, so just to give you an example, so we're in the container application right now. I'm doing webpack.config. The only thing I want to, see to you, show to you guys is if I go in plugins, right, I don't have module federation insta instantiated. Why? Uh, I, I told you before, but like we're doing it through code. So like I said before, you have the choice between a string, doing a function, or you can do it through code. So in your case, we're doing it through code. Uh, I'm going to just like go a little bit in our source code just so you guys can understand what's the setup. But I think you will find it's a very typical like React setup. There's nothing very spe uh, special beside uh, the um, the part about the micro the model federation uh, loading other micro front ends. So you know we have a root container. Uh, we decide, hey, do you need the header? Do you need a footer? We load the body. 
So if I go in the body, I'm going to index, I'll go here. We have secondary navigation, uh, order notification things. Do you, have, do you need a left bar? And then we, got, we go to route list. And that's where there's a little bit more magic. But up to now, I think you can all see that it's like kind of very typical React application, nothing very special here. So um, let's go in routes. We'll go see the route list now. So in route list, what you'll see is that we actually iterate over uh, navigational items. This is the things that our uh, teams define for each of their micro front end. So if I go, for example, uh, in here, you'll see an example of that. So they all go in there. And basically, when they execute the CLI to build the micro front end, they tell them, OK, go back to container app and just like add your uh, list your new micro front end. So you give a path. You give uh, where the micro front end is and the name. And with that, on our side, we're just able to execute what we need to pull your micro front end for you. So uh, if we go back here, you'll see that, OK, uh, we have a routes. We're doing some authorization. And then we do a remote micro UI React application. And in here is the thing that loads all the other micro front ends. And again, like it looks like a lot. And most of this is taken from directly from examples that they provide to do this. But the idea is kind of simple still. Like you'll see, like it's just create element script is going to load the remote entry. And then with that, then it does a little bit of magic. Uh, and this magic is uh, right here. So that, that's where it becomes a bit more complex. Basically, you do a wait. And it used a window. So that's all modification work with your name that you provide. It's like a global variable. And then basically, you pass whatever modules you want to pull. So we're pulling root, like if that would be button from the example before. Uh, and the setup here is a bit complex. So sorry about that. But like our idea was like each team can define basically like their fallback. Like we'd never like re really finish this. But uh, in a nutshell, it's just like loading this and then executing the module and then returning it. Uh, and then afterwards, what we do is we pull the React DOM for the micro and I'll explain why just a little bit after. And then we render it. So again, it looks like magic, but actually it's not very complicated. You don't have to do this, right? Doing a React DOM render, you could embed your component directly because it's just, it's a module that is for it, it could be just a component. We don't do it this way because, and we, we have a reason and I'll show just after, but it is something that you can do. And it's the first thing that we did when we first uh, doing this implementation. So that's the container app. Like on the micro front end uh, setup, um, I'll show just the Webpack config just to show you what it is. Um, you'll see here we expose two things. Like I said, we just saw, right, in the container, we expose root. We expose React, uh, React uh, remote React DOM, so the React DOM of this front end application. And then if we look at source, then it's just like your typical React app. So nothing really interesting here. So I'll just go in app just to show you, but there's nothing specific. So it's just like a default boilerplate for teams to get started and they have, you know, utils for them to go be more productive, things like, you know, how do you localize your text, use feature, all kind of, kind of thing that's like it's all app direct specific stuff that we don't want them to think about. It's just there and use it. Okay, so that was uh, we're set up. So now stuff to think about. What did we learn? Well, let's talk first about deployment. So uh, I said before, like one of the big advantages of micro front ends is that you have independent deployment between whatever you were using before and these new micro front ends, right? This also come with some challenges, mainly, uh, how do you track, all your container app is tracking that your micro front ends has been updated. Like how do you provide this new version of a container app and then redeploy it or create an API? Like what do you do? So at AppDirect, we chose the simple way for now. I'm not saying we're gonna stay with that, but I'll show you what we do. Um, and there's some reasons for that I'll just explain. Uh, so what do we do? If we go here, you'll see that the remote.entry, right? There is no version. So how do we handle that? Because you know, in a perfect world, uh, you put that in a CDN, you cache it forever, and you stop thinking about it, and then there's a new version, you cache bust it, right? We're not cache busting it. So what we do is we have a cache control, no cache. So what does did that do? Well, basically, uh, it doesn't mean that the browser won't cache it, but every time it loads in this thing, it needs to do a network hop to our CDN to know if there's a new version. If there's a new version, it can pull it from, uh, from cache, but if there isn't, 
then, uh, uh, sorry, if there's a new version, you can pull it from the CDN. But if there's not a new version, then you can pull it from cache. It was inverse, but that's what I meant. So uh, I'll remove my usable cache, and I can show you what I mean right now. So if we look at the requests here, let's go here. Sorry. You see that yeah, the, you see the wait for server response. So that's him doing a network hop to the CDN, and then it doesn't download content because it's already on the browser. There's no update on the version. So what else you can do? Well, um, well that before that it support a promise and a promise, right? So you have a couple of options. The first thing you can do is every time you deploy your new micro front ends, you have some hooks, some actions uh, that will go uh, directly in your uh, container code, update some JSON file, and redeploy the container app. So you could do that. Uh, in your case, we have eight production clusters. So, and so the, the connection between deploying to all the, the production clusters and updating the container app, because you can update a container app before it's deployed everywhere, is kind of difficult. So we didn't want to go with that. The other thing you could do, uh, you, after you deploy to a, a cluster, you could have either an API updated or a JSON file somewhere that exists that you update with the versions of your micro front end. So for example, you update storefront UI, uh, it's just deployed, you have a hook that will go into updating that API saying, okay, now your version deployed is 1.01. Um, and yeah, so uh, the potentially other options, like that's the one that I've seen most often. Uh, all that to say, like having a good deployment strategy, like is a bit more consuming, like than we anticipated uh, for the setup. The other thing to think about is application dependencies. So uh, I said it before, like Mother Federation actually uh, magic, kind of magically uh, managed uh, pulling all the dependencies needed for, for your federated modules and then uh, tracking that. And it's trying to get through semantic versioning. So I mean, if you have two versions of React Query like this, uh, it can know if it's not the, same, the right version of React Query that's loaded and then pull the new version and then uh, so that your application still works with the, its correct dependency. Um, in theory, that's great, uh, but it really depends on your setup. So what we found out is um, at the beginning, we really had this setup where the container app was pulling the micro front end and it's, it's just a component, right? The micro front end is a component and we, it's embedding it in the life cycle of the kind of application passing down props and like magic fun fun. Uh, the problem that we got is that I don't like I don't control the other teams. Like some teams use React 17, some teams use React 18, some teams use uh, certain dependencies that like do things. So what happens if you load uh, have a container in React 17, you have micro in React 18? Well, it's gonna crash. Uh, you're gonna have like weird behavior, like uh, you're breaking the rule of hooks, even if you're not breaking. Sometimes dependencies are embedded inside uh, a micro front end and you're using the same dependencies embedded in the, um, in the container app. So there's kind of a lot of weird behavior that can happen. So what we have to resort to is actually not embedding it directly in the life cycle of the container application and uh, kind of like just rendering it, rendering it on place using the React DOM from the micro front end. So that's why we expose the uh, React DOM of the micro front end because we never know the version of React that this application will use. We don't know, like it could be anything. In the future, it could be React 19. Uh, so we pull it from, we, when we request a micro front end, we expose both. We expose the app, we expose its React DOM, and then can, we use the React DOM to render its own code. So we're sure that like it always render in the context of how this application was built. The cool thing you can do though, uh, doing this is that you can share your remote your React dump, right? So uh, doing that, you kind of like forego of the performance issue of like adding like 100K of code uh, just to add React dump available for this application. Okay, design consistency. So that's another one that I've been asked before. How do you, if like you have uh, 250 engineers in four different offices, you don't look at what they do, how do you know that uh, they're not doing things that not according to uh, your design language, right, or branding. So uh, interestingly, it wasn't really a problem at AppDirect, so, uh, and I think it's basically for two reasons. One is we have a UI library for like four or five years now. 
the designer, when they build their UI, like that the uh, engineers need to build, right? They have, uh, they're like in Figma, they have their own thing, which is 100% aligned with our company UI library. So for engineers, it's really hard to go around and say, oh yeah, we're, we're gonna use material design here. Like you can't, like the design from the designer doesn't align with that. So having an internal design system like is super critical, if you, especially if you have a distributed kind of like setup in your organization so that you, could, you keep like that, uh, your, your style kind of like according to your design language. The other thing that we do is that is quite interesting, oops, sorry, uh, is that we, is the way where designers are structured. So uh, a designer is not part of a product team. We have one team that is the UX team that all the designer are, are into. And basically those designers are, are kind of a pool of resources that are shared across the company. So what does that do? Well, um, you're in the checkout team, you need, oh, what's that? Yeah. Oh, that's that. Okay, we, you are in the checkout team, uh, you need some design, right, new UI, so you can take a resource from the UX team, you're gonna work with the product manager and everything, but in the background what happens is that as they build this UI, uh, they go back to the UX team, together they look at globally what's happening in the quarter, and then uh, it means that the UX team one has a global view of everything that, so if there's a new UI pattern, they ping my team and then we discuss about, okay, what do we do about this new UI, new UI pattern? Do we create something new in our company library? Is it the one-off or things like that? And, and the other thing is because they're going back to the UX team, even the designer cannot go like a wire, right? Because it's gonna go back to the design team, the UX team, they're gonna look together at the designs that they're building. So it kind of make both sides kind of align, right? The UX team and the designers are all aligned, the engineers uh, have the company library and then the Figma library that the designer used to build their UI uh, is based on the company library that we have in React. So it makes kind of everything kind of go together. Okay, uh, last thing, server-side rendering. So it's possible to do server-side rendering of the federation. Uh, there's actually, especially with Next.js, there is a library to do that that's been authored by the Author Model Federation. Uh, there is, in my opinion, there's two issues with server side rendering in Model Federation. One is uh, it's not been something that's been used a lot across the industry. So if you have issues, it's gonna be a bit more difficult to find an answer on those things. Uh, but the biggest issue is kind of the security, uh, uh, the security threat potential. So think about it this way. So you have Model Federation, right, uh, in the browser. So that's server side in the browser. Like if your CDN get hijacked, what can happen? So the attacker can get access to your user session, do public API call, things like that. If it, the same thing happen on the server side, uh, on the server, so using server side rendering, well, it's not the same level of threat, right? You can have potentially access to your server secrets. They can poke around your network. They can potentially access your database. So, uh, it's, it's quite uh, another thing to, uh, to do it on the server side. Uh, one thing I would say is that if you wanna do it to server side, the only way for me that makes sense is that your JavaScript is kind of an internal to your network, right? So in the browser, we don't really care, right? It's coming from a CDN. So like where everything is public. If you're doing server side rendering with Model Federation, your JavaScript, if you wanna be secure, needs to be your network. So if you're in, uh, on your Amazon AWS, you have a network, you can put your resources inside your network and it's not accessed outside of your, of your network, right? So nobody can, can play with that. So that, that helps a lot with, with this kind of security issues. But in my opinion, and it's been like a year that uh, it is supported on Next.js, but I'm still kind of iffy about, about server-side rendering. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if you're still doing server side rendering for SEO purpose, in my opinion, like Mother Federation, not necessarily the best solution for you. Like if you're doing that, it's fine. Like I'm not saying it's not possible or you shouldn't do it. Personally, I would not necessarily go toward this solution 
uh, server side rendering is a great technology. Like I think Next.js is also a great technology. Like if you're asking me, like if I start a new project today and then like I have a small organization with eight engineers or something like that, I would use Next.js with like something called TRPC, which allows you to create APIs as functions that are typed, and then you can have your front end that's typed with your function. So there's like a lot of for me, like the only thing about model federation doesn't really answer your problems in terms of architecture when you're a small team. It answers your problem when you have a large organization that is stuck somewhere, and then like you don't you don't finding productivity anymore with your tools that you're having right now, and out that helps with that. Although I'm not saying model federation is not a good architecture, like you could build a great architecture today as a small team with model federation. Like personally, you wouldn't be a choice, but it is possible. Um, okay, so two things about, uh, if you have to remember about model federation, uh, in my opinion. So first, having a good deployment strategy for your micro front ends, probably gonna be more time consuming than you think, like building that, like for us, like we thought it would be easy. At the end of the day, you saw that for a solution, right? It's still kind of like, it's not as big, but it's not the best it could be. Like, like the best it would be, would be it's stored in a CDN forever, and then we do, you do cache busting. Uh, the other thing to be careful with, uh, if you're using a model federation the way it's intended, right? So you're actually putting modules and using component directly in your app, like be really careful about your dependencies. What we found out like maybe five days into integrating model federation is that teams would do things that would break the content reputation. And that's why we had to separate the life cycle. Uh, by the way, it's something I didn't say, but like the only thing that like we found was an issue with surprising the life cycle. It's, it's not that, but is that one thing you need to be careful is that because we're doing, um, I'm going to go back, sorry, just one thing I want to say. Um, if you're doing this, uh, you need to be really careful how your container app is rendering. Because if you do this, you can't just remember your container app as you want. Because what is going to happen? I'm going to have a white flash screen and your microphone is going to boot back up, right? So you can never reboot like this portion of the code uh, if your user is already on the page. So you need to be really, really careful what you do. Although like, because it's kind of a simple setup for us, right? We, it doesn't do a lot of interaction, never been a problem for us, but still need to be careful with your state variable there. Okay, uh, so micro front end, should you use it? Uh, in my opinion, again, uh, you have a monolith having a hard time spinning up, you have team scanning issues, and I would definitely recommend you investigate micro front end, model federation, like all of those things uh, can help you greatly. Uh, if you're looking for example of how to use model federation, well, I have a very good, uh, <laughs> very good answer for you guys. Uh, the author of model federation uh, created uh, a repository with every case, every example possible of what you might want to do using model federation. So it's super easy to find, right? It's model federation slash model federation examples. If you look for model federation examples, GitHub or whatever, you'll find it. And I know it's small, but you, like right now, what you can see, but like it's like Angular to Angular, different version, React to Angular, uh, like every possible way. This is all ways you could use Mother Federation right now. So he created examples for all of that. So if you're looking at integrating Mother Federation, you have a use case. Probably you have an example in there that show the use case that you want to do, which is super cool. And that's what we use to build uh, or or set up. Like, uh, and even like he's always working on it. So he did some updates on or on or set up. So we're looking how we can integrate the, the changes there. Yeah, that's it. I'm ready for questions. Yep. A V exit equivalent? I think there is one, but I think it's, it's not super ready. But I've seen people doing uh, Kind of a plugin for Vite uh, for Model Federation, and I think it's called literally Model Federation Vite or something like that. Uh, but I'm not sure how much ready it is. On our side, like we just use Webpack because it's more part of for us that is stable than like, the speed of it. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, but we were already set up this way, so that was already a problem. So uh, what we do is that we take for granted that some UI won't be updated. That's it, yeah. Yeah, so 
I mean, it's a large application. Like I said, some parts are still in the mallet, so they have very old UI. So for the product manager, it's not like out of the blue that like, okay, some apps are not up to date. So that's what we do. Um, if the apps are worked on regularly, right, they're going to give receive the update because like they, we use semantic versioning. If they're not work, worked on regularly, then yeah, then they might get out of date. What I would say is that we try to not do incremental update, but more large updates. So you might have like a big update on design system like per year, but uh, it's not going to be every month we have a new thing that we just fix into into somewhere. So, yep. Do you have a team who's responsible for the microcontainer? Yeah, that's my team. Yeah. Uh, although my team is like, uh, we're three people, so it's not like it's a large team for 250 engineers. Uh, but uh, what we found out is generally, um, it doesn't take a lot of people, once it's built, right, it doesn't take a lot of people to maintain it. Our idea is that the teams need to be fully independent, so they don't need to require us to have uh, micro front ends. Um, the only problem that we have more is around operation. We don't have a lot of very deep people of operation. That's like probably one of the reasons why we still have cash control, no cash, is because we have a hard time getting the resources to actually fix that problem. Yep. I'm not sure how to, to put this question, but uh, like in the React DOM factory, yeah. so it's in, the, in your team, right, the container. Um, but it decides if it 